Good evening to everyone, and I welcome you at the place which usually has a different. I welcome you at the place which usually has a different function, but uh, from time to time it is a pleasure for us to transform the destination of this place and the function of this place. So we are happy to present the book tonight for you, and we shall be talking about the history of philosophy. We shall try to find the answers to some questions. We shall try to pose the questions of why it is so important in the modern world. But before we start, there are some technical um, announcements. The presentation will be in Ukrainian, should you need the interpretation into English, please check your headsets for interpretation. You can get some headsets at the entrance, but the lecture will be in English with the interpreting into Ukrainian. So this event tonight is to launch the public uh, follow-up program for the conference that started yesterday, Ludwig Fleck and his thought collectives. The conference is uh, co-organized with the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences, Ukrainian Catholic University and the Center for Urban History. At the focus of the conference, uh, as you probably have already seen, is the life, work and legacy of a microbiologist, a philosopher, Ludwig Fleck. His concept of thought collectives. This is the work that has become one of the milestones in philosophy of epistemology and philosophy and also inspired other philosophers like Thomas Kuhn and the idea of the uh, science paradigm. But this conference and also this event uh, is for us um, the possibility to connect Fleck uh, and to bring him back uh, and his legacy and his heritage back to the city. And also we wanted to, to inscribe the city, the locality into the world of ideas. This part is very important uh, indeed, uh, not only bringing back the legacy of uh, Ludwig Fleck and his heritage and his biography and his knowledge and his texts, but also this is the way to actualize and uh, this is the way of thinking in the concepts, in the inspirations, in the approaches that he dealt with, that he explored uh, in the period uh, uh, that we will learn about uh, from Professor Marcy Shore, which is uh, has been later termed as interwar years. So this event will include two parts. Uh, allow me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stefania Ptashnik. Stefania will be getting closer to the microphone here, to the podium. And I will try to introduce her meanwhile. She is the research associate of the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences in Germany. She used to study at Lviv University doing the German uh, philology studies. And also she studied at Heidelberg University. And the area of her research interests includes historical linguistics and multilingualism of Lviv of the second half of the 19th and the early 20th century. Stefania was a guest researcher in Vienna at the Institute of Sciences of uh, Human Sciences. And this is the place which is also very important for Professor Marcy Shore where they met. In Vienna, Stefania was translating from German into Ukrainian the work by Ludwig Fleck. You can see here how the scientific fact evolves. In addition to translation, Stefania also had an idea and in several years, the idea has grown into a workshop, into a project. This is the workshop that is taking place these days, in fact. On behalf of the institutions that are working together under this project, uh, we, we, we were happy as an institution to contribute to the implementation of this idea. Well, Stefania will tell us more about the book project. Thank you, Sophia, for this nice introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
now I am happy to welcome everyone present here at this special evening. It's not my evening because we are hosting professor of Yale University, Marcy Shore, and the scholar of the Institute of uh, Human Studies in Vienna. Since she was in Vienna at that time, it uh, was a great opportunity and a great honor to have her here for a day and a half uh, to contribute to our workshop. So. Thank you for this introduction, Sophia. We, before we focus on uh, Marcy Shore's uh, lecture, I would like to tell you more about the context of this evening. It is part of a public program of this international workshop, which is called Ludwig Fleck and his Thought Collectives. Uh, thought Collectives are in inverted commas because they have the double meaning, and I will explain why. This event is taking place in Lviv. Uh, and, uh, it focuses on the personality of Ludwig Fleck, a scientist, a researcher, a microbiologist for the uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, he is little known. Well, some four years ago, I have not had any idea about him. So let me tell a couple of words about him himself, about the author of this book. He was born on July 11, 1896. Uh, back in the Austrian uh, Lviv in a Polish Jewish family and he has been growing in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-lingual atmosphere. He was fluent in Ukrainian, in German and in Polish and he spent two thirds of his life in the city. He went to school here and we know that he went to the gymnasium number four next to the uh, Lviv Polytechnic University. Then he went to study at the medical faculty at the university, so it's his background. Uh, um, microbiologist. He started his studies back in the Austrian University, Franz Joseph University. After the war, after several years in the war, he completed his studies in the Polish University of Jan Kazimierz, because it was the name at the time. Here in Lviv, he was writing his philosophic and medical works, uh, uh, was engaging in debates and uh, thoughts. During uh, the studies, he was interested in the microbiological studies, and he got to know an expert uh, in uh, the typhus and actually it was very interesting how it was happening back then um, so he was uh, his assistant for a short time and then he worked closely with professor in the 1920s he founded his own bacteriological laboratory back in the Bronok 8 Street at the Konesko Street. In parallel, he also worked in the unit of the internal me um, medicine on Lviv uh, City Hospital, and then he was head of the uh, skin diseases laboratory in this hospital. In the first place, he was interested in the research of leukocytes, typhoid, cephalus, and TB. So it was purely to uh, really microbiological stuff. So what are we talking about then tonight? All of the communities that he was part of uh, actually provided the environment for the researcher to develop the idea of a thought collective. That is why this thought collective is the expression in inverted commas as part of the title of this workshop. And he provided the definition of this notion um, as such. He was also a frequent visitor at different meetings in different uh, scientific environments, not only medical communities. He also worked together with the members of the Lviv Mathematical School, Guggenstein, in particular. They worked together on the method of the research of the leukocytes. He also was engaging in the discussions of Lviv philosophers such as Kazimierz Twardowski, Mkiewicz, Isidora Domska, a psychiatrist, a historian of sciences, Bilkevich, Leon Pistik, and many others. There are many names to be mentioned that were important for this interwar years. However, the German occupation uh, made Fleck uh, resign from all of his positions, and together with his wife and son, they uh, had to settle down uh, not far from Lviv Ghetto, but in 1943, he was brought to the Auschwitz concentration camp and then to Buchenwald camp. Uh, 
uh, his profession actually helped him survive because he was uh, skilled in producing vaccines against typhoid because it was crucial at the time in the war years. In April 1945, they were released with his family by the U.S. troops, and then he continued his career not in Lviv but on the territory of Poland for some short time. He stayed in Lublin, and then he moved to Warsaw. Here in Warsaw. He had quite a brilliant career because he was supervising many uh, theses uh, and dissertations uh, that were defended. Uh, but he really resumed uh, this theory presented in this book uh, very few times. Uh, he was mostly concentrating on microbiology. But in the last years of his life, he got sick and he then moved to Israel. And at the age of the uh, 84, he passed away. He supervised uh, over 50 doctoral theses and habilitation theses in various academic journals. Uh, uh, 87 publications were uh, came out uh, for the philosophy of science. Uh, and for the epistemology, the most important uh, work of this Lviv period is uh, about the evolution of the scientific fact. Uh, the book was written in 1935, uh, and uh, it had really the complicated uh, fate because he sent this book to Moritz Schlick, the founder of the philosophical uh, circle in Vienna. Uh, so uh, these uh, intellectual links were still possible for Lviv at that time. So he helped uh, for his, uh, ask for his support in the publication, but he was not able to provide it. So this book was published in the original German language in Basel, Genesis and Development of a Scientific Fact. The book uh, continued uh, in a very interesting way. Uh, shortly before the publication, there were many reviews, about 20 reviews for the book. Uh, however, the reception of the book was interrupted, disrupted for some period of time. Uh, we still have a little understanding of why this happened. Was it because of the interwar complications or because of his Jewish origin? However, the second uh, life uh, was given to the ideas of Lerk by the work of uh, Thomas Samuel Kuhn, a U.S. researcher, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. In the foreword for this book, he stated that he found very many useful ideas uh, from the work of LV microbiologists on thought collectives. Uh, in the 1980s, Fleck has become extremely popular. Uh, they started uh, referring him as the most prominent epistemologist of the 20th century. The book was written in German. Several days ago, did the book uh, come out uh, in the Ukrainian translation? It was the first time for me to take hold of this book only on, on Monday. So we brought some 20 pieces or uh, copies of the book from Chernyutsi. You could buy them tonight. The book is about the problems of the theory of cognition and the problems of the philosophy of science. This is the research of the genesis of the scientific fact uh, and scientific knowledge. The concept of the thought styles and thought collectives is described here. These concepts are distinctly associated with the name of Ludwig Fleck. He considers the genesis of scientific facts as the outcome of the activities of the scientific community because they are relying on the experience and knowledge of their predecessors. Fleck was one of the first to uh, focus on the social and historical preconditions for the cognition process. And he uses the facts from the history of medicine to explain this such as illustrating the unit of disease of cephalus. And uh, it is in the focus of his central hypothesis. Any knowledge is always preconditioned uh, in cultural and historical terms. Therefore, to interpret some scientific facts, you need to know about the knowledge of the previous uh, 
periods. Flag underlines the significance of community for researchers and the role of an individual in the process of cognition, knowledge, and learning. So we were listening today about the stories of how this vaccine was being developed. It was clearly seen how this collective, how this community, uh, which gr each group and each team of researchers contributed with their specialized research outcomes to the general result. Uh, in his opinion, no knowledge or no scientific fact can be studied uh, outside the thought collective generating it and outside the thought style developing this knowledge. Let me quote some of my favorite uh, places from this book. An individual could be compared to a football player. A thought collective could be compared to a consolidated uh, football team. The process of learning could be compared to the course of the game. Can we analyze the game from the position of the individual kicks on the ball? Because this way we lose the sense of the game as such. This is about games and uh, balls. You got interested, right? Each has a very peculiar thought collective and uh, knowledge because it depends on their thought styles and all their background of knowledge. So in the opinion of Fleck, the scientific knowledge cannot be considered beyond the social context because it's indispensable and integral uh, with a human as the medium of this knowledge. I think it's a very interesting quote. Uh, well, thoughts are hovering around from an individual to an individual and they are transforming and changing and modifying because different individuals, uh, they have uh, uh, different associations to different knowledge. To be frank, uh, uh, a person can never understand the idea in the way as uh, the those who express this idea want him to understand this. So who is the owner of this uh, idea that is still hovering around? This is the idea of a collective, the idea, the thought that doesn't belong to any specific individual irrespective of whether these are true or false, whether they seem uh, to make sense or not, they are still flying around in the society. They are being polished, uh, consolidated, enhanced, or weakened or undermined. They do impact other ideas, thoughts, uh, and uh, thought habits. And very often, this uh, discovery comes back to the original author who in his turn takes a very different look on the same idea and he seems to have seen this discovery in this uh, manifestation and in this expression as such even though it has been transformed in the recent years we have witnessed uh, the resumed interest in the ideas of Lek um, in the u.s environment and in european environment by culture studies scholars historians philosophers and other representatives of humanities and sciences here the theory of thought styles and thought collectives deserves much attention and also some consideration about the nature, about the experiment, about the meaning and significance of illustration and visualization, about the, the focus-centered uh, scientific research. And they are distinguishing between the popular science, journal science, and uh, research science. But I think it's time uh, to draw the conclusion because uh, you can read more in his book. Uh, and getting closer to the topic of the lecture by Marcy Shore, I would like to add that we are uh, trying to get some retrospect to the interwar years, and this is a kind of conglomerate of the thought collectors. This is the time when certain political, artistic, and philosophic uh, uh, directions and areas developed uh, that had the signs and characteristics of uh, flying around uh, from an individual to an individual, producing peculiar thought styles. Uh, 
Before I pass the microphone to Sofia and Marseille, allow me to express my gratitude to anyone contributing to the production of this book. In particular, this is the Institute of Human Research in Vienna, the Center for Flag Research in Zurich, uh, and the Center for Modern History in Zurich uh, that provided the materials uh, uh, free of charge for, that helped to translate this book. And also, I would be happy to see Andreas Adnina, who uh, probably is here, or maybe he is not. This is the Goethe Institute that supported the publication of the book. And of course, the publishing has itself the book 21 in Chernitsi. Thank you to the team, to the editors and proofreaders and designers, and also allow me to express the gratitude to the person present here, a very highly professional and uh, persistent editor, Nazar Fadorok. This night, this evening, in addition to Goethe Institute and the Institute of Human Research from Vienna, is also supported by the City Council of Lviv and the German community of uh, scientific research. To conclude, uh, I would like to say that uh, all of this uh, effort uh, is relying on some uh, really tender shoulders, Natalia Otrishchenko, Oksana Avramenko, and Sofia Edyak from the Center for Urban History, Elena Haleta from the Ukrainian Catholic University, and our volunteer students. They were instrumental to bring all of us together here to this specific and peculiar thought collective. And this idea would not be possible without Marcy Shore, who managed to come here for a day and a half. And uh, I would like to pass the floor to her. Thank you again, Stefania for your contribution and bringing this text here to Lviv. When we were thinking about the conference, when we were designing the agenda for the conference, we realized that we wanted to see the city in flag, flag in the city, but we cannot avoid broader context, the spaces, the places, the environments, the communities where this text was born. And they are instrumental to understanding and comprehending this text that we are going to read. In order to comprehend this text and these notions, it's important to understand which questions were posed by whom, what was the important debate of this time. And we really hoped to see Professor Marcy Shaw here. And we are fortunate to have our hopes come true. And she is an expert focusing on the research of Central and East Europe, uh, researching the intellectual biographies, the history of philosophy as such. Uh, I can only voice and announce some facts from her biography. The professor teaches and lectures at Yale University, but she graduated from Toronto University and uh, Stanford University. She focuses much um, on, on the research, which is also part of interest of the Institute of Human Research in Vienna. Some of the publications are available in Ukrainian. This is the book, uh, The Caviar and the Ashes, The Life and Death of the Wars of Generation in Marx, 1918-1968. This is the book that, uh, well, it's not in Ukrainian, but part of uh, the chapters are taking place in Lviv between 1939 and 1941. Uh, should you have a chance, please take a look. This uh, life of the ashes, uh, the totalitarian regime in Eastern Europe, and the history of revolutions uh, uh, in close up. Uh, if you have a copy, you can have it signed by the author. In 2004, Marcy was awarded by a very important uh, and prestigious uh, uh, scholarship. Uh, the bucket time grant, and uh, this is the current project. She's engaged in the phenomenological meetings, uh, the scenes from Central Europe. Marcy, I invite you to take the floor to start your lecture. After the lecture, we will have the opportunity to ask the questions and also to think about uh, 
some of the important uh, and also minor questions that we might be inspired by. The floor is yours. Sometimes it's stating the obvious that can be the most revolutionary thing in certain moments. 
What he says is that the connection between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. There's no particular reason why this combination of letters and sounds need refer to that object. You know, English could just as well have a different word that signifies that tree outside. There's no internal necessity, be it biological or metaphysical, that dictates that any particular combination of letters or sounds refer to any particular object. So the connection between signifier and signified is arbitrary. Now, nevertheless, the connection is stable. We can't just wake up one day, you know, normally and decide we're going to call everything by a different name. I and mean, you could, but then we wouldn't be understood. So meaning is stable. It's held in place by the system of the language overall. But the original connection is arbitrary. Now, the fact that the connection is arbitrary allowed for the possibility that the connection could be severed, that those things could be disentangled. And this is going to become a jumping off point, a starting point for the avant-garde. You know, in, in 1913, the, the Italian futurist Marinetti declared the slogan of words in freedom, words were to be liberated, in this case from syntax, from grammatical rules, you know, from the conventions of usage. Uh, the following year, the French futurist Apollinaire um, declared in the, uh, the, anti, the futurist anti-tradition that there should be no regrets, we should embrace polyglotism, the invention of words, the freedom of words. Now that same year, two Russian futurists went a step further. Um, I'm going to talk just for a second about Alexei Krutyony and Belyar Klevnikov. And they declared slovo kak takovoya, the word as such. And this was also a way of liberating words, but it was far more radical than Marinetti's. Because Marinetti had liberated words from syntax, from grammatical rules. Kruchonik and Plevnikov are actually going to liberate words from the signified. They're actually going to try to sever that connection between the word and the thing it represents. And then there's a radical freedom. Then suddenly words become things, and you can do what you want with them. Um, now, now you might let, let me now let me now mention something that's going on right around the same time that Apollinaire wrote um, the the anti-futurist tradition or the, the futurist anti-tradition, and, and, and Klevnikov and Kruchonik declared the word as such. Um, and that's that there was this young radical named Gavrilo Krinsvik um, in Sarajevo who assassinated the Austrian archduke and heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand. Um, and I'm going to mention that assassination, which I, I know you're all perfectly well aware of, um, together, with, together with the fact that three years later, in 1917, now three years into the First World War, um, incited originally by that assassination, um, the Germans are going to smuggle Vladimir Ilyich Lenin back from Switzerland, where he was writing a book, to wartime Petrograd in a steel train car. Um, and and I, I mentioned that assassination of, of Gavrilo committed by Gabriela Princi of, of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and of Lenin's trip through Europe in that sealed German train car. Because either one of those things could have very easily happened otherwise. Princip might have not managed to assassinate Franz Ferdinand. He may have gotten sick. He may have gotten distracted. Something else might have happened to him. He might have ceased having an interest in revolutionary activities. He could have fallen in love. He could have run off somewhere else. Um, that assassination might not have happened. And anything 
could have happened to that sealed train car that Lenin was in traveling through wartime Europe in 1917. And the reason why I like to reflect on that sealed train car is that it seems to me that anything happens to that sealed German train car and Lenin doesn't get to Petrograd in April 1917. And I think there's arguably no Bolshevik revolution. And the entire 20th century happens differently. So you might ask, what does all this have to do with Cicero <laughs> and structuralist linguistics, which is a perfectly good, uh, a perfectly good question. Uh, uh, both of these things together and the juxtaposition of them allows me to introduce the topic, which will become central in intellectual life, of contingency of radical contingency, the moments when a different combination of sounds might have represented that thing outside, the moment when completely different words might have been chosen to represent things, the moment when the First World War might not have happened, the moment when the Soviet experiment might not have happened, that feeling that at any given moment, things might have been otherwise. So, so let me now go back to the fact that uh, that assassination does happen. And Lenin does get to Petrograd in 1917. And he does make a separate peace with the Germans. And in principle, the First World War ends in November 1918. We just commemorated the centennial of that. But I, I think, as, as you all know, in, in Eastern Europe, the First World War doesn't really end in 1918 at all. It keeps going on and bleeding into other wars. And the overall context of the moment is one where the combination of those events destroys a whole world. And nobody knew what was coming next. There was a feeling that all the old rules had suddenly been broken. And, and what the new rules were, nobody knew. Four great empires fell. The German Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Tsarist Empire. It was a kind of great conflagration. One world wound in flames. And what was coming, nobody really knew. And that feeling that something had gone up in smoke, and nobody knew what the rules would be, and anything was possible. I think in some ways the, the, the essential kind of, is the, the essence of the zeitgeist to kind of grasp going into that post-war period. Now, Stefan Zweig would famously describe the years after the First World War as the end of the age of innocence. And he has one very particular example. As, as an Austrian, and as a Jew, as a Habsburg writer, he says, after the war, after the First World War, you could no longer travel without a passport. In fact, after the First World War, without a passport, you were not even really considered a human being. And for Zwei, this was what the age of innocence meant. Um, it was a moment where there was a radical polarization of the political spectrum. You know, so we see happening in the background, together with this introduction of passports, the a kind of move towards the poles, a move towards the extremes. The right becomes more radical, the left becomes more radical, and the center is going to kind of melt into air. It's going to dissolve, it's going to go up in, in smoke. The other theme I want to kind of put out there is background, and this goes together both with the polarization of the political spectrum and the age of, end of the age of innocence, is that what ends together with that innocent age is something I would call a kind of imperial cosmopolitanism. And being in Lviv, I think you're in well placed to understand what that meant. Um, towards the end of this lecture, I'm going to talk about 
um, phenomenology and, and some of the people gathered around the Moravian turned German philosopher Edmund Husserl and Gettigen. And they come from all over. They come from all different backgrounds, they come from all different countries. And they gather around him in the 1910s, kind of just the high, the, the most creative moment and the most exciting moment is in some sense those years right, right before the First World War. And it was the last moment of a kind of imperial cosmopolitanism, a kind of innocent cosmopolitanism. After we cross the border of the First World War, I'm going to spend some time talking about aesthetic theory and the avant-garde. Then we have internationalism. And you might say, why is cosmopolitanism any different from internationalism? And I might be making up my own definitions here. But what I want to suggest is what Zweig suggests, a kind of loss of innocence. There was a certain innocence to the imperial cosmopolitanism, especially but not only under the Habsburgs. After the war, the adamant, you know, ideological internationalism of the avant-garde betrayed a recognition that now borders existed and in order to cross them, you had to be willful. It betrayed a recognition that now national borders were real and hard, and to cross them was a certain kind of aggressive revolt. It was no longer innocent. It could no longer be taken for granted. Um, and, and to give you an example of that kind of belligerent internationalism, uh, I'm going to quote one, one of my all-time favorite documents from the Russian archives. In fact, I, I love this document so much that after paying $20 for one photocopy of it at Margali in Moscow, I then actually kind of blew it up and had it framed and kind of on the wall of my office, um, which, which not many people could read because it was bad Russian handwriting, but I loved it so much anyway. And this is a letter that three very young futurist poets from Warsaw wrote in July 1921. They're 20 years old. And this was Alexander Vaz, Anatol Stern, and, and Bruno Yashevsky. And they wrote, you know, in the name of the Polish in the name of the Polish futurist, which was quite funny because that was the three of them were basically it. You know, so they were writing in the name of themselves, in other words. And, and they sent this letter um, via also to Vladimir Mayakovsky. Um, and, and they said, maybe I'll, I'll, read, I'll read the first line first in Russian because my English translation fails to completely capture it. Polsky futuristi, navianzimayev nashenye sfuturizdami usiech strahe. Peresimayev futuristo, ruski bratskoye fridietsvia. So, Polish futurists establishing contact relations with futurists from, from all countries Send the Russian futurist fraternal greetings. It goes on to request contributions from Mayakovsky, from Kamensky, from Barluk, from Plevnikov for, unquote, the Pierre de Bolshoi Internationale Journal Gazeta Posviasheni Yesmierni Futuristicheski Poesi na Vsiak so the first large international journal newspaper devoted to universal futurist poetry in all languages. Um, and, and the language is an extent to which both they were very deliberate about their internationalism and the extent to which as 20-year-old as students they took themselves enormously seriously. Um, their, their, their first large international journalist newspaper devoted to futurist poetry in all languages lasted for exactly two issues. Um, their, their love for Vladimir Mayakovsky lasted much longer and ended quite badly. Um, but the fact that it ended, lasted for only two issues was not atypical. All of these avant-garde projects, endeavors, had very, very short half-lives. You know, all of these various journals, one after another in all these different countries, tended to come out for a couple issues and then was overcome by something else or displaced or they had a new idea or they wanted a new title or they had a new 
friend, um, or they, they moved to a new place. Um, and the fact that they had short half-lives, I, I mentioned not, not to belittle them, but because it was a reflection of just how quickly time was moving. And this feeling that time was moving very, very quickly. You know, Marinetti wrote this letter in 1923 to the Polish futurist in, in French, and he's like, we test, we test. He's like, faster, faster, so we're speeding, we're speeding along. Um, and in, in Poland at this time, a kind of a hyperinflation in the economic realm, Literally, 
what has fallen should still be pushed. It was almost a kind of model uh, that away with the past. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote you here a couple lines from Ga, which is the first almanac of Polish futures poetry. Yeah, a, a wonderful document for those of you who haven't gotten around to reading. Um, I'll, I'll quote it first in Polish, because again, my, my English translations can't always do justice, especially to the avant-garde stuff. So, ga, pierwszy polski almanac poezja futurystyczny. Wielka tęczowa mapa zwana Dionysa dawno już dechła. Wyrzuczamy jej z gminu z puszczyzna, odwłaszamy cywilizacja, kultura z ich chorobliwością, na śmietnik. To prudent to the nation of the world and to Poland, the great rainbow monkey named Dionysus took his last breath long ago. We are throwing away his rotting legacy. We declare civilization, culture, with a sickliness to the trash heap. This, this empty space was very much a space for freedom. And this is also, this is very kind of reminiscent before the time, kind of of that letter of Sancho's existentialism. This idea that this emptiness was precisely the space for freedom. And in 1918, you know, right at the same time, the Ukrainian futurist poet Mikhail Semenko wrote, it now put to my ascendant I feel myself without limits. And, and that very much captured that spirit of the moment. I, there are no more limits. The avant-garde kind of exalted in this there are no more limits kind of feeling. Um, they, they exalted in the formal experimentation, in the rejection of mimesis, um, the rejection of the role of art, of literature, of representation. That kind of went together with the severing of the connection between signifier and signifier. Because language was no longer transparent. Now language was like a material thing. It could be like a toy. If words were things, if they had no necessary connection to the things they represented, then why did they need to function as things representing anything? Couldn't they just be things unto themselves? Couldn't we just play with them like toys? So art was no longer about reflecting life. It was about creating life. It was about creating the world absolutely anew. And this is where you get all this aesthetic theory that is preoccupied with the relationship between form and content. And the idea that we've been thinking too much about content when really art is about form. Uh, and that was something that was shared by, by Vant, by Rowan Jacobson, by Stanislaw Neumann, Leon Kamistek, um, Vincazzi. Um, you know, Vincazzi tries to encapsulate this as the idea that form as the construction of the complete work is everything, and so-called content is an inessential addition. Um, and, and the fact that form was everything, that it was not dictated by content anymore, that space for freedom, that was the space of radical contingency. That was that space where anything was possible, this kind of unhinging, this untethering, that there wasn't any longer anything to ground us. You know, now we were free to create the world anew. Now, I'll, I'll quote Alexander Vata again, because he captures this so well. Natomiast tu był on radość, właśnie z tego, że coś tak gruntownie od Polska przełamia, że właściwie jest miejsce na wszystko, że wszystko wolno. So, but for us, the joy came from the fundamental class that there was now room for everything, that, that everything was permissible, everything was doable. And it was a, a bit like when I, when I, I talked to my, my students at Yale about the avant-garde, you know, for whom this is all very remote, I, I tried to get them to imagine, this might be an overly American example, I'm not sure, um, like the free fall drop at an amusement park. Do you have those 
there are these horrible American amusement parks with lots of rides that like spin you around or take you on roller coasters. I, I go on none of them, by, by the way. But there's some of them at like the big American amusement parks where they just kind of drop you. Um, and that's supposed to be fun. Again, I, I've never <laughs> done it. Um, but it's very common if you go to these big amusement parks. I don't know if they have them in Europe. But in case you can, you kind of just get dropped. I mean, apparently safely, or, or so they say, and it's supposed to be thrilling. And I think this was the feeling the avant-garde had. You were being dropped, and it was, it was ecstatic, it was thrilling, you were kind of free-falling through space. But that, that thrill, that ecstasy, was just a hair's breadth away from absolute terror, because there was nothing at all to ground you. And it, it was very much that spirit of Dostoevsky. If, if you remember, if you remember that moment in the Brothers Karamazov when Mitya is describing to his brother Alyosha the moment when the woman named Katerina comes to see Mitya, um, and, and, and he says to her, and I hope I don't ruin this quote with my my bad Ukrainian Russian. Uh, he's talking about looking at Katerina as she comes to the door, and he says, Yana etu zgladia tagda segundi tri elikiat se strašnoju nienavistio, stojo samoja nienavistio, at ktoraj do budvi do bezumnejši lukvi, a din vanasoka. So I, I looked at her, I looked at her for, for three seconds or five seconds with this terrifying hatred. The, the kind of hatred that's only a hair's breadth away from the kind of maddest, most desperate love. And this, this, was, this was the feeling of the avant-garde, the, the ecstasy that was a hair's breadth away from terror. Um, the, the love that was a hair's breadth away from hatred. Um, and, and what Mitya felt for Katerina and reflected very well what the avant-garde felt as well towards the self. All of these emotions from the great romantic novels were now also turned on the self. Everyone was obsessed with the self. You know, either loving the self or hating the self or both or, or aggrandizing or dissolving or preferably both. Um, Beauty was always a hair's breadth away from repulsion. Joy was always a hair's breadth away from despair. Uh, you have all this language of, of these, these modernists and these avant-garde theorists and writers. Leon Kvistek talking about how pure formism you know, aspires to pure beauty, to feelings of joy. We're always talking about joy. And the, the great Czech poet, Yaroslav Seifert, talking about how I am a poet, a poet of the joy of life. The, the Yiddish poets, Peretz Markish and Moishe Brazeran, we, the young ones, a joyous game, full of song. A joy was one of everyone's favorite words. Um, but the other favorite words were things like going, I, youth, abyss, and an I, the I, the self, was always yoked to both joy and abyss. You know, and, and joy was also always kind of juxtaposed with abyss. So there is this motif of total self-absorption, kind of mind-blowing narcissism, you know, and a simultaneous drive to complete self-annihilation, to total self-annihilation. It was Eros and Thantos, it was narcissism and self-hatred, you know, confidence and terror, joy and despair, and through all of this, the self was this unbearable burden. So you keep coming back to the I, the obsession with the I, with what is the I, as this terrible burden. Um, and and yeah, I think that the best example of this, which I, I fear now is, is long forgotten, um, is a poem that Alexander Moss wrote in January 1919 when he's 18 years old and kind of sick and feverish. And, and it's a poem called Ja z jednej strony i Ja z drugiej strony mego obsożelanego piecyka. So I from one side and I, all caps, from the other side of my cast iron stove. And he writes, O ponocy należy zawsze z 
składać wodę w chory. Oślepiające, tak oślepiające duś gilotini. So at midnight, it's always necessary to place your head under the dazzling, yes, the dazzling knife of the guillotine. You have to love this. I know nobody sees it anymore, but it's great. Um, so I, I want to give you a sense that it was a, a time when the existential stakes were high, and it was also a time when disciplinary boundaries were very loose or very flexible, or perhaps there were just a lot of Leonardo da Vinci type Renaissance figures. And Fleck is a very good example of this. We don't run into these people anymore, but people like Vincassi and Leon Camista and, and Fleck, they, they're in all sorts of fields. There's aesthetic theory, and there's epistemology, and there's mathematics, you know, and there's microbiology, and, and it, it doesn't really happen these days that people kind of move out of their own disciplinary boundaries so often, but it did then. And in fact, it was quite common. Um, and the fact that mathematicians uh, like Bistek were writing about aesthetic theory was, was normal. Um, and I, I think that also, that has to do with how seriously they took themselves, but also has to do with the, the, the dimensions of the questions that they were asking of the world. Okay. So I, I might want to kind of transition here and then tell you about a second related topic. So I want to propose that there were two major responses to this unhinging, this feeling that absolutely anything was now possible. You could embrace the unhinging, embrace the untethered, you could embrace the free fall and kind of get drunk on it, which is what the avant-garde did. Um, or you could start to look for a bridge. You could start to look for a way to connect the self back to the world. Um, and there were at the same time, and to some extent overlapping with these avant-garde circles, and I, I won't go into too many biographical details in this particular talk, but there, was, there were philosophers who were feeling the same spirit of the moment, and they were feeling that the imperative was to ground the self again and find a connection to the world, as opposed to embracing the untethering. Um, so this problem that Lesha Kolkowski will describe it as the problem of the bridge. The problem of the bridge is how do you get from that I to the world? How do you get from the subject to the object? Um, from, from from consciousness to being, from mind to world, from inner to outer, from imminence to transcendence, and there are all different kinds of ways you can describe it. But basically, it's a problem of how you get from the I from the self to the world. Um, and, and let me, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start by, by I'm gonna introduce the, the philosophical response with Vincazzi, which may or may not be a good idea, but it's kind of irresistible. Um, so this is Stanislav Ignacy Mikhailovich, who was one of the very colorful, flamboyant, obviously crazy and brilliant um, avant-garde figures, hanging around mostly in Zagopani. He was a painter, he was a playwright, he was a novelist, he was a philosopher. He was also narcissistic, hedonistic, demonic, with a kind of manic appetite for pornography, orgies, mind-altering substances. And, and he aspired to pure form. You know, he aspired to sever form and content and embrace form. He aspired to what he described as, you know, treating pictures as certain constructions of shapes imbued with life of their own possessing a formal unity independent of the objects being depicted. And he set his, his idea of pure form, again, in opposition to traditional art as representation, in opposition to pictures that are some kind of reflection of the world, because we're no longer reflecting the world. And what is the world anyway? We are creating the world. But Vincanti also, by the way, aspired to what he described to Ingarden as, 
as the creation of a metaphysics with the absolute exclusion of God. Um, I, I want to talk here just for a moment about his modernist hallucinogenic Bildungsroman titled Yena Fitzenia, Insatiability. Again, I don't know how, many, how often people read completely crazy novels like this anymore. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are reasons not to, but let me do indulge you just talking about it for a couple minutes. He wrote it in 1927. It was published in 1930. It, it tells the story of, of, of Genjipo, or Zip, um, who loses its virginity to a princess, faces an invasion of communist China, ultimately encounters the pill of Murti Bing, a reference some of you might know from from Czesław Miłosz's book, The Captive Mind. Miłosz kind of takes it from his Kasi. Um, ultimately encounters the pill of Murti Bing, a kind of miracle drug that allows for the total transcendence of self, the total overcoming of the I, and the dissolution of the I into a unity. The themes of, of the novel were life's diabolical possibilities, obscenity, madness, disgust, metaphysical horror, the demonic nature of sexuality, the desirability of death. Um, because he wrote not only of orgies, he also wrote of what he called metaphysical masturbation. That is physical, philosophical solipsism, the idea that all that can be known are the contents of, of the mind. Um, and, and the problems related to solipsism, this excessive absorption with consciousness, consciousness like a box, there's no way out. He was obsessed with the problem of the constancy, or rather the inconstancy of the I. How do you hold the I constant over time? Does it, does it just dissolve? Um, um, what do you do with an I that seems to be a kind of psychic, transparent eye that takes up no room in space? How do you ever come to terms with the fact that there are other eyes, other selves out there? All of the characters in Mia Nasitsenya struggle with this unbearable burden of subjectivity. Um, and so Vincasi shared um, with, with Husserl, with Freud, you know, this impulse to probe the essence of subjectivity. And his ideas in some ways were closer to Freud's than to, to Edmund Husserl's, who I'll talk about in a moment. Yet it was Husserl who was Vincasi's absolute obsession. It was his philosophical nemesis. Husserl appears time and again in Nina Fitzenia, which if you've ever read Husserl, he writes like a mathematician, very dry and technical. And then you read Nina Fitzenia, which is this crazy hallucinogenic modernist orgiastic thing. You just couldn't believe that like both of these people appear in the same book. Um, but, but Husserl is the uh, obsessive philosophical nemesis, the object of all all Vincasi's graphomaniac attacks at the time. And and Vincasi faults Husserl among other things for the fact that he that Husserl is constantly passing over the body and gazing at the world through eyes hanging in air. Husserl has no body. He accuses him. Um, and, and the, the narrator in the Nasitsenya says, describes Husserl as a truly inspired madman whose mistakes are worth a hundred times more than all the correct assertions of academic pseudo-proofs too squeamish for introspection in psychology. And at one point, the hero of this Bildungsroman, Zip, um, is described as his self-collapsing and Vincasi writes, his ego collapsed in a pile of random, disconnected, indeterminate states. The latter were so-called intentional acts, as posited by the phenomenologist, suspended in a void, impersonal. These intentional acts performed by pure consciousness. And the polemic that Vincasi, in his crazed way, has with Husserl in this novel, is, is with Husserl's idea of pure consciousness. So this is a kind of long introduction to who is Husserl and what is pure consciousness. 
And if you think reading Husserl might be boring because he's a terrible writer and writes like a mathematician, um, if you read Nyanasitsenya, you might be more inspired to go on to read Husserl because Vinkasi is completely the antithetical kind of writer, and you would never imagine these two men could have any kind of dialogue whatsoever. Okay. So let me go back to Husserl. Um, Husserl was born in, in the late 1850s in Habsburg, Moravia. Um, he uh, studies in Leipzig, he studies with Brentano in Vienna. Um, he's uh, a, a young, beginning professor in Germany, and he suddenly has this realization one day while he's lecturing that here I am standing before my students empty. That, that here, I, here I am, I suddenly felt, he writes, that I had nothing to say, that I was standing before my students with empty hands and an empty soul. And then I resolved to submit all existing theories of knowledge to the most severe and, unrelent and unrelenting criticism. I began to seek the truth where no one had sought it before. So Husserl is going to be the most kind of dramatic of these attempts to find a way back to connect the self to the world, to stop the free fall, to insist that it can be done. Um, and out of this existential crisis that Husserl has, feeling as he's lecturing that he's completely empty, is going to come his first great work, which is Longisha and Tsukhiga, the Logical Investigations. And if he will declare there, I, I personally, it's a miserable book to read. It's very, very long-winded. Stefania just told you all what a wonderful editor she had for this book. When I read Logisha Winter again, I think, wasn't there an editor? <laughs> Didn't someone tell him that those first 200 pages of the attack against psychologism could have been reduced to 15? Um, and anyway, I okay, I'll stop complaining about Logisha Winter again, but the basic point that he insists on there is that the task of philosophy was to search for the absolute, non-relative, non-contingent, not merely psychological truth. And you have to believe it can be done. You have to believe that we can connect the self and the world, that we can ground ourselves again even after the death of God. You have to believe it can be done. What is true, Husserl insists, in Logisha and Husserl again, is absolutely intrinsically true. Truth is one and the same, whether men or non-men, angels or God, apprehended or judging. Um, and the only way we could get back to truth was we had to return to the Zafizelps, the things themselves. Um, and for those of you who don't speak German, this is not to be confused with Kant's idea of the Ding an sich, which is a thing in itself, which tends to get translated to English the same way. Um, but Husserl is using a different word, which is a word that could also be thing in the sense of matter, or topic, or issue, or question. So it's a return to be that that helps. And Husserl is complaining about psychologism, because this idea that we can understand the world by understanding the workings of the human mind, how the human mind empirically works, that's just another version of this impoverished empiricism and impositivism. And it's necessarily contingent, because we're not trying to figure out just how our minds work psychophysically. We're trying to get to absolute truth. Uh, and there has to be a way to get to absolute truth. I mean, I'm kind of, when I'm, when I'm lecturing to my students in the States about this, I say you can think of Husserl a little bit as, like, as the Barack Obama figure. He's the one saying, yes, we can. He is insisting on the yes, we can. Uh, and he's going to be the classic example of an intellectual who believes that you can dance at two weddings at once. Uh, we don't actually have this expression in English, but um, I know it from Polish and also from Yiddish. And maybe, can you think of probably saying this you can't dance at two weddings at once. No, you can't say, okay. Who's um, believe you could dance at two weddings at once? That, that you can have all the richness of pure subjectivity 
and all the certainty of the objective world without compromising on anything. And this was his obsessional uh, attempt, that you could prove this connection between the self and the world, that yes, you can, we can ground ourselves in the world again. And this is the thing that was so seductive to the students who come to get again in, in the 1910s. Um, and in particular to this young man named Roman in Garden, who comes from what was then Habsburg Lemberg, who was a student of the Kashmir's Tomardolskis, um, who wore a beard and you know, read the great novels of Morda Polska and dabbled in writing poetry before he had this youthful existential crisis and discovered that felt like none of this is working. I'm not getting to truth. Maybe my poetry is not any good. And he doesn't really seem to go back to it. Um, and he leaves to Bardolsky, which will then become a kind of relationship drama that will last a large part of his life, but that, that's not so interesting. He leaves to Bardolsky and goes to Bardolsky's colleague, Husserl, and Bardolsky and Husserl have both been students at Bertano in Vienna, so it's kind of, they're coming from the same philosophical family. Um, and Tvardovsky kind of sent them to get again to study with this role. But the point anyway, that Ingarden is so excited, you know, in 1912, you know, as this very young man, um, a, a university student in his second year going to get again, is that he believes that Husserl is the one who can help him prove the existence of the world. And what is so moving about Ingarden is that he will spend the rest of his life trying to prove the existence of the world. And his last great work in three volumes, unfinished, was Explore Oisienia Shiata, The Controversy Over the Existence of the World, which is like over 1,500 pages, and the third volume is never finished. He dies in mid-sentence, um, and the existence of the world never quite gets proven, but you feel like, you know, maybe if he had finished that sentence, or maybe another one, and, it, it, what happens when it finds it, he's going to spend his whole life doing this. And he believed that it was Husserl's phenomenology that could make this connection. And this is what all these young people who came to get in the 1910s believed. Um, and Husserl's I, I, idea, um, if phenomenology was an epistemological method, and I know I want to kind of dwell on epistemology for a few minutes, and we'll keep you here that much longer, because this is where Fleck is going to come in. Um, so epistemology are kind of or it's a study of knowledge, of the possibility about knowledge. And Husserl's going to say the problem with psychologism is that it's really all about the empirical workings of, of the brain, which is too relative, it's too contingent. Uh, you need to get to something more certain. But he doesn't want to do that by what he will call decapitating the subject and leaping into the positivist realm of pure objectivity. He wants to get to certainty while maintaining the robustness of subjectivity. And this is the dancing and two weddings problems. I mean, it's arguably not and can't be done. But he has this idea that there is something called pure consciousness. There's a pure I that can somehow be disarticulated from the empirical I. Um, and let me try to kind of give you an example, because I, I, of the, the decade or so that I have obsessively tried to figure this out, I can describe it in theory, but I don't see how it can be done. So suppose you're looking at an apple, and you see like there's a particular apple there. You know, and the apple is kind of unlike, precisely unlike any other apple. It's a little bit lumpy here, and maybe a little bit tilted there, and like the red starts to turn into green over here, and the colors are slightly different. There's no other apple exactly like it, and each apple is slightly unique. Nonetheless, there is some kind of universal, call it platonic essence of appleness. Some essential universal thing that makes that apple an apple, despite the fact that it has differences from other apples. Um, so you have the empirical apple, the specific, factual, particular example, and then you have that kind of universal essence of appleness. Okay. Um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of variation on Plato's idea of pure forms. Um, now suppose you turn that towards the self. So you have your particular empirical eye, which is unlike any other eye. We're all different physically, psychologically. We all have had different experiences, different histories, different color eyes. 
um, different habits, whatever. But there's also some pure I, um, some rhyme and speak, um, some pure essence of consciousness that Husserl believes can somehow be distilled. That you can somehow, by stripping and stripping and stripping everything that's particular, you can somehow get to some pure essence of the self that is both the most intimate interior part of the self you can get to, but also paradoxically, curiously impersonal, generic, and universal. So that is going to be the eye that is going to reach out for this connection to the world. Um, so this is what he's got, can be described as you kind of disentangle the empirical self from the transcendental self. Um, and in, in Ukrainian um, in, and in Russian, you have two words for, for truth, for empirical truth and transcendental truth. So you have pravda, which is empirical truth, and kind of an Eastern now, which is transcendental truth. So if you kind of think about by analogy with truth, how you would apply that to the eye, there's this kind of transcendental eye. So pravda is like, it could be countable. It could be multiple. But Eastina is singular. There's only one. So the transcendental self is somehow singular. Um, the other thing about Husserl's self, the self that's going to connect itself to the world, is that, curiously, it's completely the opposite of Freud's self. And I find this fascinating because Husserl and Freud are both assimilated Jews from Habsburg, Moravia, born basically at the same time. Both of them study with Brentano in Vienna. They have weirdly parallel biographies. They both come up with theories of radical subjectivity, and they're completely opposite. For Freud, everything essential is hidden. Everything important about the self is precisely the part that you, you don't have access to. For Husserl, the purest, most essential part of the self is the part that is completely transparent. The part that has the ability to purely see the world. This idea of rhymes say a pure see. Um, and, and what phenomenology promises in some sense is this possibility of pure seeing and the idea that we don't have a solipsism problem. The mind is not enclosed in a box because the structure of consciousness is intentionality. And intentionality is not intention in the sense that, you know, I intend to do my homework or I intend to practice the piano. Intentionality is a structure of consciousness which is a little bit like a string with a magnet attached. And imagine it's always kind of reaching out to grab the world. It's reaching out to grab the object. So the philosophical move here is that rather than cutting off signifier and signify, rather than severing that connection and saying, now we're going to play, we're in a kind of free fall, this is completely the antithetical response. You say, rather than starting with the subject and deriving the object or not, or starting with the object and deriving the subject or not, you start with the relationship. You say, in the beginning is the relationship. Subject and object are connected in such a way that they cannot be disconnected. Um, so in the beginning is this bridge, this absolute transparency that if you perform this methodology correctly, you're supposed to get to pure seeing. Now, is pure seeing is exactly the same that Fleck is going to contest. Because Ludwig Fleck is going to say that there is no such thing as pure seeing. Because seeing is always already socially conditioned. We're always seeing through a certain lens. And that lens depends on where we are, when we are, and who we are with. There's no such thing as a kind of reflect. There's no such thing as a as a kind of transparent interaction between subject and object, there's no such thing as transparency. There's no tabula rasa moment when we start from nothing and can purely see. There's no such thing as purely objective knowledge. And this kind of gets at kind of the crux of the debate. Can we be connected to the world at all? If so, is that connection going to be contingent? Is there such a, is there such a thing as transparency? Uh, are we always, always already stuck in our minds? Uh, and you can also compare, you know, Flat, Husserl, and Freud to, to Bistek's theory of, of the yellow, the multiplicity of reality. Yeah, 
Lee Steph writes that there is no defined way of presenting what is real. On the, on the contrary, the same object can be presented in many different ways. Um, the idea of being always already embedded in some kind of way of thinking, um, you know, and what, what Stefani just told you that Fleck calls that this kind of the, the, the dank collective, that what is English thinking collective? Thought collective, yeah, the, the thought collective. That's actually in some ways closer to, to Heidegger, and let me just spend two minutes here talking about Heidegger. So Husserl's star student who he believed was going to be the one to carry out the phenomenological method into the world, um, in 1927 produces this book called Sign on Sight, dedicated with, with great respect um, to his doctor father Edmund Husserl. And there, Heidegger is going to get at the subject-object connection to the world problem entirely differently. He's going to say it doesn't make any sense to say how do we find this bridge from subject to object? How do we know the world exists? How can we get connected to it? It doesn't make any sense to ask that question. Because who can ask that question other than we ourselves, the kind of beings who we are, the and Dasein? And we are always already in the world. Immersion in the boat. You know, there's no outside. There's no stepping back. There's no distance. There's no place to step back and look at the world as a subject looks at an object from a distance. Because we're always already inside, we're involved, we're concerned, we're part of it. Um, you know, Heidegger has this great word called glorfenheit. You know, we're always already glorfen um, uh, in the world. I, I love teaching my American students the word glorfenheit. Like, I always tell them, you never know when you might need the word glorfenheit, thrownness. Um, Polish, I don't know what it would be in Ukrainian, this kind of thrownness into the world. You never, it doesn't work in English, but you never know when you might really need to use the word glorfenheit at a cocktail party or something. Once you know that word, you, you will wonder if you ever could live without it. Um, but the interesting thing about the glorfenheit, okay, we're always already thrown into the world, is that you can read being in time and say that this idea of how we can know the world, because we're always, we're always doing it from inside, not from outside. There's no real distance. We're always already bound up in it. So it's this reconnection to the world. You can see that reconnection to the world as being a kind of grounding of the subject, <laughs> of being a kind of fleshier, more robust, solid subject. You know, a kind of grounding that is a step towards grounding from Husserl's idea of this transparent, transcendental self that takes up no room in space. Or you can say that when, when the self is now kind of immersion, immersion in their belt, when the self is now always already in the world and can no longer be disarticulated or taken out of the world or separated from the world, once you no longer have a subject that can be somehow disarticulated or separate, separated, maybe that's the dissolution of the subject entirely. Maybe that's just like a step towards saying there is no more self. So you can legitimately read being in time in both ways, you know, as a more robust grounding of the self or as, as a step towards the complete dissolution of the self. Um, you, you can read it like, like Dostoevsky's Mintia looking at Katarina and said only, you can read being in time and saying once the self is always already thrown into the world, not able to be disconnected or separated from the world, that is only a hair's breadth away that separates the radical grounding of the subject from the radical dissolution of the subject. Heidegger was to Husserl what Freud was to be in his liberalism. Okay, um, I know you're talking for a long time, so I better stop talking very soon. Um, so as, as you all probably know, Heidegger becomes a Nazi, um, Marinetti becomes a fascist. The avant-garde, by and large, and especially in, in Eastern Europe and East Central Europe, makes a leap into the arms of the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, it, it ends very badly for them. Radical contingency and radical nihilism meant infinite freedom. Um, 
all of this infinite freedom, this nothingness, this absence of stable meaning, the ecstasy of it, the indulgence of it, all turned out to be existentially unbearable. And, and ultimately, the avant-garde fled. And they went from like Dada and futurism, which is kind of the reification of contingency, the idea that anything could happen at any moment, anything was possible. They, they went from that to, to utopian dogmatism, to, to abject prop, to proletarian poetry. Um, they went from contingency to determinism, from nihilism to dogmatism, from nothingness to totality. The, the futurist poet from Wood, Mikhail Bandorsky, writes to his friend Wadisa Bradyevsky, Revolution is a painful tragedy, a glorious fire in which you must burn yourself, descend into savagery, into barbarism, in order to discover in yourself the simple joy of life. But there's a very long 600 page book by, by uh, a writer named Derek Sayer called Prague, Capital of the 20th Century, A Surrealist History. And, and this, this whole long 600 some page book hinges on a meaning that the Czech surrealist poet um, Vítislav Nezval, a surrealist and a communist, who, who meets the French surrealist poet André Breton and Paul Eluard uh, at a certain cafe in Paris on May 9, 1933. Henceforth, um, Nezval and his friend, then friend Carl Taiga, invite the French surrealist Breton and Eluard to Prague. They finally get there two years later in March 19. The relationship between this tiny handful of Czech surrealists and tiny handful of French surrealists, um, both of whom are, all of whom are self-absorbed and narcissistic and self-indulgent and in love with revolution, you know, and in love with, uh, in love with psychoanalysis, you know, and the possibility of everything being changed and all sorts of things that don't go together at all. In fact, this was the motto of surrealism, the coupling of that which cannot be coupled on a plane that is not appropriate, the juxtaposition of things that are completely opposed to one another is to be embraced. Um, Derek Sayer actually tells the entire story of the European 20th century through the prism um, of the meeting between that handful of poets. And it's an extraordinary book, and the extraordinary thing is that I think he gets it right. I mean, I think he actually finds that story through the prism of which the whole thing can be captured. So, highly recommend it, whether or not you thought you were interested in Czech Surrealism. Um, okay, 1933, the, the Nazis take power. Husserl, who was a passionate German patriot in the First World War and then lost his son fighting in the First World War, um, is non-Aryan. Heidegger is, is the rector of his university in Freiburg, where Husserl is emeritus. Husserl, like all other professors of non-Aryan origin, is, is thrown out and expelled and banned from the university. And at a loss as to what to do, Husserl, Husserl writes these passionate letters to Roman and Garden. Which the writing is much better than anything he did in his very, very long winded book we show, which you still get. If you want to get to know who's I really recommend the correspondence with, with Romani Garden. Um, and what he does in 1933 is he retires to his study and he tries desperately to clarify the phenomenological method. Because he deeply believes that if only people will see that, yes, we can. Yes, it can be done. Yes, we can reach epistemological clarity and absolute truth. That is going to be the thing that will save civilization. He then goes to Prague in, in, in 1935 to give the lectures he can no longer give in Germany, and says the problem is that enlightenment rationalism proved too thin, that our notion of reason coming up in the enlightenment ignored the, the, the subject in favor of a leap into the realm of pure objectivity. It disconnected us to the world. We need to reconnect ourselves to the world. We need to ground our objectivity and subjectivity. And if people just realize that it could be done, we could retain all the robustness of the human subject and still reach absolute truth, that would be the thing that would save civilization from irrational barbarism. Um, now, now, Husserl then, then died in 1938. Well, one of the most beautiful pieces of, of philosophical writing, or maybe philosophical personal writing, um, is, is the, the Kievan philosopher Lev Shestol's um, eulogy, or memoirs, of, of Husserl, which he writes immediately upon Husserl's death in 1938. 
1938. Just off, as many of you may know, from reading him, is a much, much better writer than Israel ever was. So he writes about Israel much better than Israel ever wrote about himself. And, and Shestov says that, you know, for, for Husserl, uh, I should also say he also then translates, in the process of writing about Husserl, he translates a lot of this German philosophy, German phenomenology into Russian. And despite the fact that Heidegger claims that in order to think clearly philosophically, it has to be ancient Greek or German, it's actually much clearer in Russian than it is in German. And Husserl's idea of evidence, which makes no sense in German and even less sense in English translation, um, is translated as Ochidinos. Um, just well translates Ochidinos, which is much like, that's actually what Husserl meant, which can't really be said in, in German. Um, and you have those two words for truth, which clarify a lot of things that otherwise don't get clarified. But in any case, Shostov says that for Husserl it was always a kind of Kierkegaardian either or. Either we can do it, we, we can get to epistemological clarity and absolute truth, we can reconnect ourselves to the world, we can know the world, we can ground ourselves, we, we can see that the light of, of reason and truth that enlightenment had promised but originally interpreted too superficially. Either yes we can, or, or we can't. And if we can't, then it's the madhouse. Then it's the leave Then we accept, you know, that, that, that there is no more civilization. And we are stuck with the irrationality that will lead us to barbarism. And Shostak tells the story very vividly that, and he tells it through the prism of Kierkegaard. So the way to understand Husserl through Kierkegaard, for Husserl it was the Kierkegaardian either or, either truth, pure truth, connected deeply to the subject, or we descend into barbarism. And as we know, unfortunately, 1939 turned out to be barbarism. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Marcy, for taking us to this journey, to being and transporting and bridging us to the period in a whole different matter and a way. Um, I think this is the moment when we would think about questions or comments because it raises so many issues. Um, while you are gathering your thoughts, please, you know, just. Show your hands, and we'll, I will look for a few more here, and we'll start with one, like so, like simple, like probably simple, like no problem. As historian, <laughs> venturing into the into intellectual and philosophical history is, um, the, this is the period that started as post and became between, and this is a period that started unflexing um, and you know, it's, it's a word to use in a room where all the furniture is, almost all the furniture is fixed to the, to the floor. So the period that started with this unflexing meanings and ended with unmixing people and the, which dramatically impacted the city that we are living uh, making reality homogeneous and solid. And uh, you know, without much value in this period, I would like to ask you about period, another period post, but not yet between <coughs> post socialist, you know, post 1989, post 1991. I mean, how the questions that were asked in this periods between are pertinent for the period not yet between. And the other way around, how basically living in the moment we are here, uh, post maybe not socially but truth, actually allows us to understand this period in a different way. I mean, after all, last few years we had celebrations of the state, 100 years, but also the avant-garde years. So if you could dwell on that a bit, that would be like bringing us to today. And I will 
keep eye for the for, there's one hand here. More hands, please, please raise. Marcy, that's there is one, there is a first question. I will be speaking Ukrainian. Please translate. No. I really liked the lecture. It's really philosophical and complicated to understand. In many respects, in many aspects, I don't agree with you. You are saying that language is the form. It's absolutely wrong. Language shapes the nation that speaks this language. You know, Russians are absolutely different and crucially different from Ukrainians in mentality. They have this uh, belligerent mentality as based on the language, while our mentality is rooted in kindness. Then you are saying that it's possible to understand the form without the content. I don't agree with this, totally don't agree with this. If you don't understand the content of form, then you cannot understand uh, the form and the content. When I am watching on the uh, painting, I don't know what it means, what are the characters, what is the plot. I don't know the story of painting this pain, uh, painting. So I totally disagree with you on that. Then, all of your philosophy, not your philosophy, but all of the philosophers that you mentioned is based on the Marxist theory about the foundation for any state, which is economy. If there is no economy, there is no state, you know. So what is the key reason of wars between the countries? It's the economic factor. Then you said the First World War was undefined in its essence. I'm sorry, but we have the same situation now. This criminal Putin, is it going to attack us or not? If he's going to attack us, what is going to happen with us? You know, the war is unforeseeable, unpredictable. Nobody knows. Well, the USA, are they going to bring their navy into the Black Sea and then into Kerch Strait? We don't know this. The, the Russians, they're claiming they're not going to let this happen because history is unpredictable. Uh, unless there are some smart... Well, another thing, social democracy brought Europe and USA to the good life. While Marxism, with its Marxist idea about destroying private property, brought to the destruction of millions of people. Even though I do respect Marx a lot, but the fact that he conceived this theory of uh, destroying private property is the nonsense, it's the utter nonsense. Uh, well, he's not perfect. Well, thank you for the good discussion. Uh, thank you. I hope it will be a good discussion. There's a lot of uncertainty. Please, you know, we have that. Two questions. More are coming. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, well, first, first let me clarify that I, I'm not actually either a structuralist, linguistics, or, or an avant-garde artist. So the idea, the decoupling of the form and content that I was describing it was not actually my idea. I was trying to describe to you what these thinkers and, and artists and writers were conceiving of at, at, at the time. Um, on, on the question, well, let, let me say this in terms of the, the question of Putin. I mean, I'm not going to talk about what's going on in Putin's mind. I have no privilege of epistemological access. But I, I do think that the, the current crisis actually perhaps is more relevant to the questions being discussed at the FLEC conference than one might think, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, so I, I was in Dnipro a few years ago talking to people for this book that I wrote about the Maidan. And, and one thing I kept hearing in Dnipro from people again and again was, especially people, I should say, who had families or friends or former friends on the other side of the border of the Donbass, you know, who had sided with the separatists. Yeah, and, and my colleagues in Dnipro kept saying, you know, Marcy, you're American. You will never be able to understand how vulnerable we are 
you know, to Russian fake news, to Russian propaganda. You will never understand how, you know, the Kremlin can disseminate stories that the Maidan was a CIA-sponsored conspiracy, and now Ukrainian Nazis are coming to kill all the Russian speakers in the East, and that will sound ridiculous to you because you don't understand what the Soviet experience was, you don't understand how vulnerable people are to manipulation, you don't understand what it means not to have a tradition of democracy and critical thinking, the continuation of homo sovieticus, you'll never get that, really. And I, I take that point, there are things about the Soviet experience that we'll never understand. But when I was back in Dnipro now, a few years later, this past fall, I found myself saying to people like, okay, I accept that there are things I will never be able to understand about the Soviet experience. But those same Russian trolls, you know, a year, two years later, came over to my side of the Atlantic and planted the story that Hillary Clinton was kidnapping children to exploit for child pornography and holding them captive in the basement of a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. Millions of Americans believe it. It arguably swings the election results. Now, we have arguably a very rich democratic tradition. We have no Soviet experience, and you can't blame homo Sovieticus. And the story about Hillary Clinton kidnapping the children and holding them captive in the basement of the pizza restaurant in Washington, which by the way doesn't have a basement, uh, is no more believable than the story that the Maidan was a CIA conspiracy. And it turns out to be just as effective, you know, in the United States. Um, so th this suggests that, you know, the epistemological crisis we're having is not just a Russian or Ukrainian one, that there's some global element to it. And that's why I think that the questions that Husserl and Freud and Kavistet and Nikotli and Ingarden um, and Fleck were asking in the interwar years about how do I know the world exists? How do I get outside my head and know if what I'm seeing is really real? You know, do we see things purely or do we see things from lenses? If we see things from certain lenses, then how can we orient ourselves? How can we take off those lenses? Can we take off those glasses and put other glasses? How do we figure out what's really true? I'm not saying any of these thinkers had any perfect answers to these questions. These are big philosophical questions that have been asked you know, since close to the beginning of time and will continue to be asked. But it might be that this is precisely the moment, you know, in this era of post-truth, and this goes back to Sophia's question, where we need to think seriously about how we know what we know, how we decide what is true and what is not true, what it means, you know, if, can we see purely or is there no possibility of seeing purely? If we're always already mixed up in something and involved and in a certain kind of mindset or in a certain pattern of thinking, what does that mean in terms of how we can orient ourselves in a complicated world and how we can make moral judgments? It seems to me that precisely because of, of the crises that you mentioned, this, this would be a very relevant moment to return to those thinkers. Thank you. We one more question here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going back to the topic of post and in between to this period mainly. And thank you for this idea of ways of connecting self back to the world. But uh, still, not only self was disconnected either by Freud or by other thinkers, not only language was disconnected by Saussure, but the world itself was disconnected and disassembled. It was disconnected by borders, by political regimes, so it was not word as a unit, probably. But also, maybe going back to the topic of our seminar on Ludwig Black and his thought collectives, and thinking also about natural science, and the world is not United in a way. It's almost uh, about the micro scale of atoms and also uh, this macro scale of huge speeds and the speed of light, Einstein, and all other figures from uh, physics mainly who give us the mass and imagination of what the world is. So, my question is to what 
those people were connecting to themselves, or at least attempting to connect, when the world is disassembled. Okay, the problem of the world being disassembled. <laughs> I think, in, in part, both, both these philosophers um, and these avant-garde artists were responding to that kind of fragmentation with a certain kind of aspiration to universalism. And I think the universalism, the aspiration to universalism, which has been present in philosophy since the very beginning, and that's, well, that's the deal, right? You try to ask big, big questions, you know, that, that are relevant, that, have, that there's some kind of truth for everybody. But I think it was part of the thinking big, was part of an attempt to ground oneself in a fragmented world. I think that went together with that aggressive desire to overcome boundaries. This very interesting book about Ukrainian futurism um, was translated to English that like, has translations of all of these different texts and looks at both how this was a, it was a critical moment in terms of the formation of the modern Ukrainian culture, and these guys were adamantly anti-nationalist and kind of adamantly internationalist. And I think that that drive to be universal, the thing that could transcend the national boundaries, my intuition is that that wasn't a kind of attempt to ground oneself in a world that was becoming fragmented. Now, of course, looking at Looking at that through the lens of elite culture, there's a bias because these are, I mean, all of these avant-garde writers, I mean, especially the East Europeans, they were much more cosmopolitan than the West Europeans. I mean, these the people, like the, the, the lots of the Czechs and the Ukrainians and the Poles, like the French were reading in French and maybe in German, you know, and the Italians were reading in French. But you know, Bach and Stern and Yashinsky were, they were bilingual in Russian and Polish, you know, and they were fluent in German and French, you know, and they were reading in English and Italian, and they were, you know, and they had passive knowledge of these other Slavic languages. So they're, they're not, they had access in a different way. And I think the fact that they were reading simultaneously in French, German, and Russian in addition to their native language, I think that, that does give you a certain access either to universalism, because you don't want everything to break apart into pieces. You don't want everything to be so fragmented. And, and the desire, the desire to find universal truth that will ground you. And my, my, my nine-year-old who's in the hospital, because he and normally he would be running around manically and you know, demanding to play soccer, but since he was stuck in the hospital with pneumonia, we, we read through in the past two days this 200 page book for young people on philosophical questions. And, and, and the thing that even he and I liked about these questions, like does God exist, what is truth, where does right and wrong come from, you know, how do we know that there's a world, is, is precisely that childlike desire to find some kind to find some kind of ultimate answer that's not just your little specific space. And there's an arrogance to it. You know, there's a kind of there's an excessive ambition to it, um, but I, you know, I, I'm empathetic to that to the desire to ask those universal questions. I think you are again in the moment of thinking, and this moment, that I think the evening and morning when the evening of thinking was inspired by your lecture. And we are so grateful that you could make it happen, you came, and that we have this I mean, journey of thinking in this very place and in this very uncertain time where we try to make relations. Well, thank you very much for being with us today and um, I'm inviting you to look at the book to try to get it over there and to read it with your own big questions. Both, but also humble. Thank you.